Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this live conversation with my very dear friend, Harsha Bogle, who needs no introduction, but I'll have to tell something very interesting about him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think about how to introduce Harsha, uh, Harsha, you have this image of being the nice guy on, on commentary. I'm, I'm worried and, about where this is going. <laughs> uh, but I remember something that Prem Panikar once said about you that when Harsha Bogle is criticizing someone, it seems as if he's coming up with a marriage proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Trust Prem to come up with something like that. He, he probably knows me better than most people anyway. Yeah. So tell me, you know, is this something who you are as a person and some, who always tends to lead with empathy? Uh, you know, I'm not by nature confrontational. I don't like confrontation and it's often seen as a weakness. And yeah. some people therefore think that I'm weak, that I don't have a stand on things and use it as a weapon. But to, but to be honest, I'm not, I'm not a confrontational person. I, I grew up in a very, everyone live with each other across cultures, religions, kind of environment. So you live and let be. You know, not not the bond line, but yeah, just just live and let be. And so yeah. I, I find that moving along with people, being happy with people is a far better way of living. So I'm not very confrontational. So I find criticism a little difficult, to be honest. Yeah, I, I'd much rather say nice things about people. So can I say so something you are... about you? <laughs> but this this is a this is a, I know that you will turn this around me on me, Arsha. So I said this is. I want for a change to be on the non-striker's end. I know you always had this big thing the, about being a non-striker. It's the fifth so ball and me... I've taken a single, Piroz. It's the fifth <laughs> ball, I've taken a single, you got one to play. No, but, but, I, but honestly, I'll tell you something. The, the India Inclusion Summit, the reason I like the idea of India Inclusion, I know we're going to talk about it, but I want to mention it right up front for, for people who are there, is it doesn't seek pity, it doesn't seek solace. It just says, look at us as we are, this is what we can do. And I found of all the events I've been to, I found that that event I went to in 2012, the India Inclusion Summit to be a deeply moving experience. But more than anything else, I get moved by happiness more than by sadness. And I actually came away far more positive about it. I, I tended to avoid uh, sort of difficult situations. And I said, no, all these people are, are, are living with it and are still so positive. I came away thinking, don't complain. Thank you, Asha. That's so nice of you to say that. And maybe I'll give uh, the audience a little bit of the context uh, as to why we are here. And you spoke a little bit about the India Inclusion Summit. Many of our listeners have been there many years. But I think it was very important for me to bring you on this conversation. Because when we were first building this platform and talking about 2012, well, people didn't even know too much about what inclusion was. It wasn't on the mainstream discussion. So when I wanted to put together this event, I was, I was a little concerned who will ever show up. And I said, I need at least a couple of celebrities. And so you were the first one whom I reached out to because I know that you would normally not say no, but also because I was always aware of, you know, you trying to do something for the larger good. And so I want to start with that question about the role of celebrities in driving social change. And especially when I look at you know, you have more than 8 million followers on Twitter. You tweet a lot about uh, blood donation. So tell me a little bit about how did you get involved in this blood donor campaign and the larger question of the role of celebrities to drive social change? Yeah, it, it's, it's a very difficult word to define, first of all. Ce who mm -hmm. is a celebrity? Uh, most times people anoint themselves as celebrities. I, you know, it's much better when someone else says that about you. But... It's very difficult to tell yourself, I'm a celebrity, because then that changes your view of the world. Every time you think, you know what, I'm somebody, there's always around the corner somebody who's doing more, uh, uh, more interesting work, more relevant work, maybe someone better than you. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant about celebrity. What it does, though, is it draws attention. So, for example, uh, Sanjeev Kapoor and me used to go on a walk uh, during the Mumbai Marathon, we used to walk, we used to walk with children from the Forum for Autism distributing awareness leaflets around. So when we did that, because Sanjeev Kapoor was there, everybody wanted, oh, Sanjeev Kapoor ji. And then they'd, he'd say, sorry, both of us actually, say, sorry, we will not give you a picture unless you've read this. Wow. 
what we did with blood donors though is none of my doing i'm just i was just a tiny little messenger amongst a lot of people doing incredible work there's a friend of mine called balu nair and many years ago when we needed blood he just i didn't know him uh, very well then and he just said look i work at vodafone we've got a whole army of young healthy men working here for us and don't worry about about blood i'll i'll just organize volunteers for you and i said right but in my time of need somebody stood up for me and so when he started this blood donors in initiative which was really to bring people who need blood versus people who are willing to donate blood onto a common social media platform and it's it's incredible people just started posting requirement and people started coming and donating blood and going and then the community grew it's well over a million strong and it's one of the most moving things when when people who receive blood say thank you very much a life was saved or as happened on a couple of occasions they said can you let us know who donated the blood because somebody anonymously had driven an hour donated blood and not met the patient just driven anonymously for an hour and then just drove back so they didn't even know who had come and i thought that is the genuine definition of selflessness not since you mentioned celebrity do things only for photo ops on page 3 mm. this is this is genuine and that is why i'm very very careful about the word celebrity because most of the genuine work is actually being done by simple people who choose to remain faceless but who are just defined by their generosity brilliant you would have seen a lot of cricketers do a lot of work right are there anybody anybody who stands out in terms of their commitment beyond cricket i mean any anything any i yeah, two or any three, names two, that come up yeah two or three do i'll tell you one thing though a lot of people cannot say in public that they are doing something even though it helps because yeah. then they are besieged by offers from people saying you do this for us too and then if they say no they're on a hiding to nothing so i there's a there's a lot of people who do things very quietly who do things anonymously uh but two or three that stand out because they've been path breaking uh one has been uh Ian Botham's charity walk from Lands End to John of John of Groats I think they call it he walks across the length of the of the UK literally walks across and people just join in and donate he's raised millions and millions of pounds for leukemia research and he just wow. walks and it just becomes a movement mai chalta gaya aur karma kya mai mai chalta gaya aur karma banta gaya i mean i, I know i'm not using yeah. the exact lines but people yeah. just go along and even when he was not too well he still continued doing it then uh, i i like what cricket australia do with the third day of the sydney test everything is pink and everyone joins in so i remember one day i didn't know about the whole pink and everything so i went in a, in a, in normal clothes and someone said to me oh today's the pink day i said oh i haven't got one and out of the blue this is all going on air somebody just at the sydney cricket ground uh, in the old days someone just popped their head uh, hand into the commentary box with a pink t-shirt wow and so i i put on a pink t-shirt but it's amazing how the community just rallies you know rallies around i remember in the days gone by vijay merchant used to be a big torch bearer for the national association for the blind and started the whole idea of of people who are visually challenged playing cricket yeah yeah and i'll tell you one thing feroz i went for one game and i said i will bat and i think i might have told this story at the india inclusion summit in 2012 i missed the ball by a yard i just closed my eyes but my senses were not as advanced as theirs so i could not play by hearing i was i'm so used to playing by sight so yeah so, so there are people who've who've done, who've done a lot of good work tendulkar's adopted a village he looks after mm. a lot of things and so yeah people do mm. not everyone does because i do not believe we must have very high expectations out of celebrities or good at one thing that they do they're not necessarily aware or good enough at doing something else thank you so much for that and thank you so much for all that you do uh, harsha very even though very silently and i know there's a lot of demands on you but i have been personally on the receiving end of all your good wishes so thank you once again sometimes uh, the let, people who just who just put a little ribbon on tend to get more of noticed more than the people who bake a lovely cake i agree but the ribbon matters thank you <laughs> uh 
maybe i'll 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 you know i'll throw a bouncer at you and i want to really go deep into this about into your helmet okay. uh, <laughs> i i want to go a little bit about your college romance and i've been very fortunate to know anita as well and she's such such a gem of a person uh, both of you were classmates at i am amdabad so tell me who proposed to whom and how did the romance blossom you are now i don't know how many years into your married life harsha 36. more than 25 30 36 36 first tell me how the hell do you look so young you you look like 40 uh you know the what's what's the, people, so i don't know which question the things to ask. people do in an effort to be kind the stories <laughs> people tell in an effort to be kind <laughs> no i'm happy i'm i'm, I'm generally i'm ha- generally happy most days yeah uh, I, i'm careful about what i eat and yeah. i found uh, i found someone who said he could transplant the hair from the back of my head to the front of my head and that makes a difference to the way you look and i've i've never tried to hide that i don't know why people try to hide what they do i mean there it is right what's wrong in that <laughs> i mean you get your people get you get your teeth done you get your eyes done you get a head and i i see nothing wrong with uh, i see nothing wrong with that anyway uh, yeah yeah of course i mean the story to be told is she was chasing me for a year and a half and i i was trying to brush her off and finally i said yeah okay now nah. in my first year at i am amdabad i was struggling to survive i was so afraid that i wouldn't make the cut to go to the second year that i just allowed my life to become more miserable than it needed to be well miserable is too strong a word because i was yeah. making some solid friends and learning some solid things over there but i i mean i came from hyderabad here's this girl from mumbai right in bombay in those days we in hyderabad used to look up to everybody from bombay and say oh wow <laughs> I mean, I'm one little small town Hyderabad guy who's going to look at me like you know, gawky. I used to have hair covering all. You could barely see my ears. You could just literally see the ear lobes. You're like that. We didn't know how to dress, whatever. But in 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 the second year, it was it was suggested by a very very dear common friend that it might be a good idea. And the moment it was suggested to me, I said, "Don't change your mind. Don't change your mind." <laughs> uh, and 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 then one thing led to another. We didn't know each other very well. Let me be very honest. We didn't know what we had in common was shared values. And I think when you have those shared values, you have a great partnership. When one person says yes and the other says no, you get a run out. Right? That's how run outs happen. Yeah, when you have yeah, yeah. different uh, definitions of a single, we have a very similar definition of life. and i had no idea man what i was getting into we are in in hyderabad we say karke dekho but it was the <laughs> biggest 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 thing that happened to me i'm a huge fan of the institution of marriage because i struck gold yeah you have to be so, lucky right and sometimes it's a, it's a lot of luck right you have to be lucky yeah uh, in finding the luck, right partner but, but yeah but also once you have i think you must respect that yeah in in our house it's very clear who i mean i remember once i <laughs> was teaching integration by parts to the kids now i'm the engineer in the in the house engineering yeah. graduate in the house but she's a yeah. math stats graduate and the boys were struggling with integration by parts and she said can't you see i said but they got father's genes father was a more literary engineering graduate <laughs> and you are the more hardcore quant maths person so we're a different family in that the woman in the house is the hardcore quant maths person and the guy in the house a little airy fairy i know i'm sort of playing to ridiculous stereotypes but every time i meet a woman who says no maths is too tough i said no it doesn't have to be don't go with those stereotypes women have i i think actually women should be better at mathematics Anyway, that's that's what happened. So uh, I I think you need to have respect. You need to have trust in, in yeah. your relationship. And once you have respect and trust, I think it takes ninety percent uh, of all the load away. I I remember you. I think it was an advice that you gave to Rahul Dravid where you said yes. you should never marry a fan. So am I assuming that Anita is not your fan to start with? She and maybe is, your biggest critique. She's a she's a very powerful, strong well wisher. I wouldn't have yeah. got to where I I I sort of stumbled on to without her. but yes she was i mean there were a couple of times when i when i did something without realizing and she said just watch out you're getting a little arrogant said, oh mm. sorry but you must have somebody who will tell you that and i fear for a lot of the young generation of cricketers coming through in mm. that very early in life they become they start earning the kind of money the family hasn't seen for three four generations put together sometimes they don't even know how many zeros and so this little kid becomes the breadwinner but also becomes a star becomes everybody who's going to tell this kid listen you're doing something wrong here don't do this 
So that is why I had said to Rahul once many years ago, whatever happens, I said, don't marry a fan because you must have somebody in your close vicinity, if not a friend, but your life partner is the best person to gently tell you, or maybe if, if that doesn't work more brutally, that you, mm. this is not on. <laughs> I, I think, I, I don't think you should be doing this. Or I think it might be a good idea if you used your strength to be able to do this. I, I think Rahul Dravid is a fantastic role model uh, in, in a lot of matters. He's married a lovely girl. So uh, wow. I'm not sure she's a fan at all. <laughs> I asked Rahul once and he laughed. But uh, I, I, I yeah. very, very strongly believe in that because... Uh, your, your life, you cannot be surrounded by people with stars in their eyes. You must be surrounded with people who keep you grounded. And the best way to fly is to have feet on the ground. So tell me about your role as a father. You've been traveling so extensively. I know one of the complaints that my wife has when I was traveling quite a bit was she told me, Firoz, you're an absentee father. Uh, and of course, that shook me up a bit. And, you know, I've been very careful trying to spend as much time as we can. But in your role, you're traveling so much of the time. What's, what's the role that you've played as a father when you look back? I wish I had done more because I think I would have understood them a lot better. I, we were very young when we got married. So when you're, when you're a youngish father, I was, we were, I was just under 27 years old. And you, may, you make the odd mistake. My career was just starting. Mm. And I was not in a position I, to say, no, I won't do that or I, I won't do this. So yeah, it helped. It helped enormously. Which I mean, you you read a little bit more about that when Anita's book on women professionals uh, comes yeah. out. The one thing Anita did, and that defined us as a family as well, is saying, okay, this is the situation we are in now. There's no point complaining about this situation. This is what we are in now. Now, how do we make the most of it? And yeah, so she she turned from being a hardcore quant person into advertising, into account planning, into qualitative research, into setting up, dare I say it myself, a very successful speaking program, which was based on learnings from sport, largely cricket. And she read more. She's a very diligent person. She read much more than I ever did. And as a result, we put together a, a very unique partnership when the two people are presenting together. And sometimes people would say it's almost like you've rehearsed your lines. But I learned from her rigor. She would never allow me to just turn up. And it's something that I've also very strongly believed in, that once you become successful at something, you run the risk of just turning up because you can just wing it. Yeah. And that is when the bad habits start to creep in. So we would, before every single, even before presentation number 602 or 603 or 537, we'd still sit together and say, this is what I'm going to say. This is what you're going to say. And there's a reason this slide is here. There's a reason this slide is going into that slide. And there's a reason we are going there because this is what the messaging is all about. So, so it, you, it, it you've always been way. you've always been known for that, Harsha. The you know everybody whom I speak to, they, nah, it comes from her. It comes from her. The, the rigor, the rigor yeah. comes from her, and the the word in Marathi that best explains it is called dhadapad, which is mm. always trying to do something. It comes from my mother's side. Wow. I mean, I know this because <clears throat> you kind of diligently prepare before every session, you take the notes, you underline stuff, you have your data, you have facts. So preparation is a very integral, and you speak about it uh, in your book and all your sessions, how preparation is so central to it. But maybe I'll, I'll you know, my hope It's a non-negotiable. It's, it's a non-negotiable. Non because yeah. when you prepare, you're showing respect to the person that you are going to speak for. Many times they're paying you handsomely. So it's, it's a respect that you show. If you accepted an invitation, then you accept it 100%, otherwise you don't accept it. Uh, you know, I promised you that I'll try to keep the cricketing questions to the minimum, but you can't have a session without cricketing questions. But I, there's one thing which I was, which, you know, which I hope someday I'm able to see yeah. you and Boman Irani in action. I, I know you did that, I think, six times, and I, I'm sure it was, I've been a laugh riot. Uh, tell me a little bit about the play that you did and why haven't you explored doing that more often, Harsha? It wasn't really a play as such. What we did was I would start off doing about 20, 25 minutes on cricket anecdotes and whatever. Then he would come and do a little stand-up act and he's very, very funny. I mean, he's, he's, he just tells, a, he's an incredibly gifted human being yeah. and he would, he would just tell his stories and then we would still have a conversation which was largely unscripted, but it worked because both of us trusted each other. We were not throwing barbs at each other, 
but but it was fun. I mean, I I'd say, listen, Baba, I'm looking at you, man. Why are you always a heroine's father? <laughs> and then he would come back to me with with something else, and it would be great fun. And that and we didn't know each other very well before that, but we really got to know each other, and it was wonderful that uh, the, the six city tour that we did. We must do it. Uh, must do it once more. And he would end by a wonderful rendition. He sings. Oh, he sings so beautifully, and he would sing in many different voices. Oh, he was he was fantastic. I hope I hope I can host you and uh, Bowman maybe at the India Inclusion Summit whenever the stars align. But that would be such such a joy. And again, I think it comes from the fact that both of you have similar values. You kind of elevate the people on the other side. You want to have yeah. fun. His it's life was more difficult like than mine, though. His his, his his life was a little more difficult than mine starting off. The kind yeah. of things Bowman's done. He's he's actually he's actually sat at midwicket at a at a small match, flat on his stomach, taking pictures because he wanted to be a photographer. Then he graduated from there to doing portfolios for Miss India people. And then yeah. I I saw him on stage, and that was magic. I saw him on a play called I'm Not Baji Rao. Oh yeah, yeah. I've magic. I've seen that boy. That magic. was brilliant. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I I mean I I I get along with people like that. Yeah, yeah. I find tell me a little bit about their stories. <laughs> yeah, tell me a little bit about f- you and fashion. You've said often that you know you grew up with two pairs of clothes, and 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 the reason I'm asking this is you've also said that a lot of the current generation is obviously very sharp, very good looking, but sometimes they forget that you know if they are doing commentary, that's their primary job. So tell me a little bit about it. Wow. Have you got, got better? <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, you, I, you can only get better from where I was. <laughs> you know, if your batting average is three, yeah. you can only get better from the, from there on. But I, I, I just do not understand. I do not understand fashion. And as recently as a couple of years ago, I asked a young anchor. I said, "What shirt? What jacket will go on this? Do you think?" And I said, "Remember, okay. don't tell me for your body shape. Tell me for my body shape." Whether I can carry it off because I mean I saw I saw this model called Mark Robinson was beautifully sculpted body and he wore a pink suit. I said Mark you can't wear pink suits and he carry he looked wow carrying off a pink suit. So I, I look at very often when I see young anchors I look at how they're standing how they're carrying themselves and I think wow man if I was half as good when I started life would have been a lot easier. I wore oversized jackets. But I always listen to when my producers told me, "Look, this is not working. This is not working. Try these colors." Sidhu taught me a lot about colors, so I, I learned a little bit as as we went along. But even now, I, I, I if I was a female anchor, and for some reason this exists, that when yeah. you go, when you have a thirty day tournament, the women are given thirty outfits to wear. The guys are given three shirts. <laughs> you know, yeah. blue, blue, purple, and a pinkish shade. Uh, uh, yeah. or a white sometimes and you just come on pull this on <laughs> it takes so much stress away but yeah I, I i do hope that young anchors starting out in this business look sharp it's a visual medium but they yeah. must understand it's only one of the things that's part of their job carrying on conversations being humble being relating to the other person realizing that it's not about you but about the other person on a show i think that's that's uh, as important i'm very interested to know your take on women's cricket and you know we'll dive into inclusion through that and one of the things that i was thinking about is do you ever see a possibility in the near future that men and women actually play cricket together which means when you have a india national side you'll also have a, a women mm-hmm. in the team do you think that's even a possibility or even say at an ipl level i'll start with the i'll start the, with the women's game I remember being in New Zealand in '94, and there's a women's India New Zealand game going on as well, and and India won the game against New Zealand. And thereafter, I found that every wherever the men were and the women were together, women won more often than the than the men did, and that that's true of uh, Indian athletics as well. That there's there's more women's medals than there are men's medals. But I'm a huge fan of women's cricket. All I would tell all of you watching, and you please spread the message: do not expect to see what you see in one form of cricket in another. You, Serena Williams does not play like Roger Federer, does not. Serena mm-hmm. Williams plays like Serena Williams. Ash Barty plays like Ash Barty. Ash Barty does not play like Novak Djokovic. 
So, mm. for example, Elise Perry is fantastic, but Elise Perry does not play like Pat Cummins. Mithali Raj does not play like Rahul Dravid. It's, it's their game played with their skills. And the moment you appreciate that, you start appreciating their cricketing skills again. So, I love watching women's cricket. I think we've been a little hard on the game in India. I've long been a, a long belief that we are two years behind time on a women's IPL. I, I think it should be on now because in the last two or three years, we are discovering that this whole thought about not enough playing base is not really true. Shafali Varma came out of nowhere. Wow, there's a field. I mean, we shouldn't be saying that, but there's an equivalent of Virinda Seva in the, in the women's game. This yeah. Smriti Mandana, what a player she is. Harman Preet Kaur's hitting big sixes. We're finding successors to Julian Goswami. Sorry, we need slowly. We need to make them superstars so that more girls start to play. And more girls start to play will become a force. And you can do so much with that. So I'm not sure they can still play together because there's a big difference in the physicality. So say, for example, you could do it in a 4 by 100 relay where there are four legs, where the men run two legs and the women run two legs. Mm. Because otherwise, a difference in physicality. So, for example, a very good, and, and they're getting quicker, by the way. So, you see someone like Shabna Mishmail of, uh, of South Africa, or some of the younger girls coming up. Julan in her, in her prime used to bowl 120 plus uh, around there, but most of the time they're bowling 107, 108, 107, 108, thereabouts. In, in the men, they're bowling 140 plus. And that's why I said they're two different games. So, it may not work playing together in the same game, uh, but they don't need to. The women's mm. game is rich within mm. itself. It doesn't need the men's game to draw attention to itself now. It's, it's rich in itself. Fantastic. I mean, what's Smriti I, I, Mandana bad? If you have nothing to mm. do, what's Smriti Mandana bad? Yeah. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And it's really grown leaps and bounds in the last probably three, four years, right? I mean, that's when we've seen a kind of a tipping point that has happened and interest has grown. I mean, look at Mithali but, Raj's career. Mitha yeah. Raj and Julan Goswami are absolute rock stars. Yeah. Let me jump into leadership. I know this is what you speak a lot in your leadership sessions. I've been fortunate to hear many of it. Mm. Maybe two specific questions. One is on reinventing yourself. And I want to kind mm. of put it back to you. How have you reinvented yourself in the sense that you've been, you've been, omnipresent in cricket for 30 plus years. So how have you reinvented yourself? That's first. The second is, I really want you to speak to me about, and the audience about leadership moments, especially in the last few you know, months or during COVID times that kind of stood out. Um, uh, so uh, you know, I, I love yeah. to share this quote yeah. that you often say about reinvention and I think it was this classic example of Shane Vaughan watching Monte Panesar and you know he asking this question is he playing the 33rd test for the first time or is he playing the first test for the 33rd time it's so timeless that quote of yours but tell me a little bit about reinvention and how have you reinvented yourself Harsha? I was lucky in that life didn't throw me choices sometimes when life throws you choices then you might pick the right one, you might pick the wrong one. But life didn't mm. throw me choices because I had no choice. So I had, I had no option but to reinvent. I started off being someone who did a bit of radio and did a lot, bit of newspaper writing on a manual typewriter. By the way, the one that's behind you, I, I, I started off with a red manual typewriter that was half the size of that one, obviously. But yeah. I, I, loved, I loved a manual typewriter around everywhere I went. But I had... I then had to reinvent myself from being a writer of languid prose to being a writer of very rapid prose, do a match report in 20 minutes and cover everything in, in that much time. Then you, I had to uh, invent myself for when television came around. And I'm a hardcore television person. So television, I, I started off on television, uh, on radio, then come into, yeah. come into television. It's a different format. Luckily for us, and I've been very lucky at all these crucial moments, we grew with the medium. The medium was... In India was Durdarshan. The medium was growing. We grew with the medium. Our mistakes were accepted as part of the medium, but we had no choice but to accept. Then people said, you've got to talk less. Then suddenly T20 cricket came around. That was a completely new, uh, you had to reinvent yourself. Commercials came in. So you, we, are, we are, as I keep telling people, we are four ball commentators. We don't, we can't do commentary on the first ball. We virtually can't do commentary on the last ball. So say what you have to within four balls. 
And so that's a handicap in a sense. But we are an advertising driven economy. So you can't complain about it because that is what keeps the sport running. So you've got to accept, as I keep saying all the time, accept the situation, then see what best you can do about it. So we have, you have to reinvent with that. You have to reinvent with the arrival of uh, newer kinds of players who are a little more touchy than the earlier generation of players. I grew up in my best years. It's a very different kind of player who was around. You could build relationships with the players. Younger players, a little more touchy about what they were saying. You have to re reinvent yourself with social media. I, somebody opened a Twitter account for me. I didn't even open it myself. I didn't even know what it was. Somebody said, you must be on Twitter and called me and said, look, I've opened your account. This is your password. This is your username. And that is how I started on, on Twitter. I still don't understand Instagram. So I'm still struggling with Instagram. And already <laughs> some people are saying that was yesterday's medium. So yeah. this, so you, you, but you have, if, if life doesn't throw you cho uh, choices, then sometimes it's, it makes life easier. Uh, I, I think a cricket captain is, in a, is very different from any other sport in that you've got to look after people on the field and off the field. Because the, when you look after them off the field, they give you far, far more than you could ever imagine on the field. So how well do you look after people off the field? And I thought a fantastic example was recently, and it rose in my eyes, was the whole issue between Temba Bavuma and Quinton de Kock. Quinton de Kock says, I'm not going to take a knee. Now, if you're a young... South Africa is a very young country in that sense. And they're, 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 they're still, it's a society in transition. And if you say, I'm not going to take a knee, it means, hang on, I'm not supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. It can have so many implications. I thought, oh, Quentin de Kock, there's your career gone, man. But the way Tenba Bavuma handled it, he gave him an exit route. He said, I don't agree with him. Maybe we all need to educate people better, but he's an adult. He's entitled to his views, but we'll talk it through. You never confront people by shutting off exits. He gave him the option to come back and Quinn Nakox back to the South African side in the white ball game. I thought it was wonderfully handled. Do you, do you think, and uh, maybe I'm sure all the cricket fans are wanting to ask this question about the DRS controversy and, you know, that clearly wasn't, wasn't a leadership moment. Uh, and I remember, I think it was in your last uh, column that you mentioned that you would like to see a calm, calculative Kohli in 2022, not an angry and rebellious one. What's your take on that? I know it's 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 maybe touchy, but just thought no. it happened recently. But no, what's different your take things on work. That? For, different things work for different people. Mm. And mm. Uh, a fired up, passionate Kohli works for him. Mm. They said that about Steve Waugh as well. That the moment Steve Waugh came to the crease, he would say, "This is a one-on-one -on -one now." And I'm going to show to you. He needed to get onto that, into that one-on-one -on -one contest, that one-on-one -on -one situation to say, ah, come on, it's you versus me now. I think that works mm -hmm. for Virat. It may not work for everybody else. Not everyone. Say so someone like me who's not a confrontational person, I may not want to get into a con uh, that kind of confrontation. So mm -hmm. it works sometimes. It doesn't work sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that cricket teaches you, and it's taught you since the time the game began, that not everything goes your way. People, umpires make mistakes. Maybe they thought technology made a mistake, but mm -hmm. not all of us understand technology as much as we should. Maybe they thought technology made a mistake, but what they've ended up doing is they've assigned motives to people. And now you're treading on very dangerous territory the moment you assign motives. But what that did, and the reason I say calm, calculative captain, the captain's always got to be looking ahead. The captain cannot be in a brawl. The captain's got to be looking beyond the brawl and saying, right, if the brawl helps me, very good, but what's going to happen next? What happened mm. next after that? India lost the match in the next seven, eight overs. You let the passion, not the, even not in the passion, let the emotion of the moment get to you and you lost the game. Can you imagine a sniper at his target? And, or forget a sniper. Abhinav Bindras has to shoot the gold medal winning shot. He's got to shoot a 9.3 plus or a 9.4 plus. Can he be driven by emotion? I know it's a different sport. Yeah. I know I've got to hit a 9.4, but that's not in my mind at the moment. You have to let the emotion go from time to time. So maybe it drives Kohli, but maybe it doesn't drive other people as much. So I think that, that, that was my view on it. I think you just say, okay, let's now figure out how to win this game. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of your writing, uh, Harsha. I mean, I have Out of Box, which you signed for me way back in 2010. And I was actually 
reading some of the articles and you know your articles have aged well they still are so relevant and i was i was looking at this chapter where you say talk about minimizing the cult of the individual you know this mm-hmm. is something you wrote way back in 2007 and i read it and like wow this is still so relevant i mean these are columns from indian express that you wrote about but tell me and i'll jump into writing because you are you've written about azhar Uh, and i was speaking to uh, suresh menon sir who's a very dear friend and he's written biographies of uh, you know bedi and pataudi and i was asking him what's the next biography that he's going to write about and he said you know writing biographies is not very viable especially about past cricketers uh, have you explored writing a biography of any players would that interest you is that on the no. on the agenda sometime no not i like to be reborn for that it's a <laughs> lot of effort for very little written i i wrote a biography for for mohinder amarnath it never got released it got re- released in a different form there after it wasn't the best experience uh then i did this book on azhar that made nobody any money but i was at a stage in my life where i was just trying so many different things i worked my backside off on it but at that stage you're just doing whatever you can to establish yourself that was great fun i'm very very proud of my writing as a 32 33 year old writing 80000 words to uh, f- for that biography it didn't age too well because of subsequent events but that's okay the the, the intention and the motive behind it i was very happy uh, i yeah i enjoy writing but it's taken a back seat in my life because the best writing is when you give yourself time yeah uh, i i i really used to enjoy writing actually the one i'm proudest of in that is is the report after i saw my first t20 game and i i think i've said somewhere there i've seen the future and it's here wow, wow. there was just before the 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 t20 world cup because it was just there uh i think that, yeah so i i i writing is is a, is easier than broadcasting because you can craft sentences yeah but it, it can get a little more laborious especially if you get used to well, this conversation over right i'm ch- i'm chatting with you and the conversation's over if you had to write it down there'd be a lot more a lot more happening and that is yeah. why <clears throat> i love people like you who read who read books the books behind you are the ones that are read the books behind mine are high on intent and low on uh, <laughs> low on actual act, actual reading no but, i i must get I must correct you there. I haven't read all the books there. You know, I buy more books I, than I can ever read. But those are good intentions. People. Nonsense! <laughs> you intimidate people by telling them this is the book I've read and this is what I've read. There's only there's two or three people who intimidated me. Raul Dravid is the other guy. When he was playing, he would say, "By the way, have you read this book? Have you read Halbus Tam on Jordan? Have you read something else? Have you read some?" I said, "Rahul, you play a cover drive better than I do." Now don't tell me you're better reader and writer than I am. No, leave me alone to <laughs> leave me alone to do that. But you could have those conversations with people then, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was uh, it was it was it was wonderful. But yeah, since since, since you mentioned it, uh, one of the things that I I find when I'm with people, and that's something I wanted your opinion on, because sure. uh, you worked you worked with people who haven't been dealt great cards in life sometimes, yeah. and you yourself have mm-hmm. have seen that very closely. One of the things I really found excellent was how when you were at SAP Labs in India. or thereafter found ways of using specific skills in and slotting them in in specific areas so someone may not be very good at x but might be excellent at y the world tends to focus on the x you tend to focus on the y and say okay what can we do what can we do from here so how how does that come about that when you're dealt cards in life you say right these are the cards i'm i'm looking at and how how easy or difficult was it to then run run your life like that yeah i mean i know you're turning it on me and i'll i'll, I'll accept no that. i also know you did <laughs> a nice girl that helps <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but in, in my case harsha i think uh, two things happened of course once my son vivan was diagnosed with autism my life changed i i think that was probably the defining moment of my life actually everything that i did in my professional career seems much smaller compared to what i've been able to contribute in the disability space uh, but it took a lot of effort i must confess i went through a very bad phase you know immediately after my son's diagnosis i went through you know being a very low period in life but um i think at some point i very quickly 
realized, and thanks to great mentors, that I, I, I looked at disability as my purpose in life. You know, there's a beautiful saying, I think this was said by a Auschwitz survivor, that if you find your partner and if you find purpose, these are the only thing, two things you need to live a good life. And I was very fortunate, like you, that I found a great partner in my classmate. But life also uh, gave me my purpose. And it's like you said, it's been you know, 10 years and I don't feel the stress at all. I converted what seemed like a painful moment into a purpose driven. It's still hard. You know, my son is 13 years old, nonverbal has multiple health issues, you know, day-to-day -day challenges are always going to be there. But I think I realize the difference between pain and suffering. You know, pain is inevitable. Suffering is something that you can overcome. Uh, and I, there was an initial phase where I was suffering a lot with questions like, why me and so on. But, you know, once I saw that as my purpose, the suffering went off. The pain is always there. You know, in some form, you will have that. And so that for me was a big defining moment. But it took many years to figure that out. I mean, I'm still figuring it out. Uh, but it's, it's the constant practice and being in it day in and day out. And of course, great friends and great people like you have su supported me in this journey. So it's, it's been a massively collective effort, Asha. Yeah, partner in purpose in pain and suffering. You know, I, I'm listening to you talk and I think I wasted the last 38 minutes. I should, <laughs> no, I, I, should, I, I should have just kept listening because we must all have a world outside our own. Oh yeah. And one of my greatest understandings was that cricket is just a game. Yeah. And we are privileged to be in this game, but we must be sensitive to the world outside the game. This game, because of the money in it, because of the adulation in it, can drive people to arrogance. And it can, it can very easily open the doors to arrogance. And I think yeah. in, in this sport, with so many young people in this sport, they need people to keep playing down that arrogance, keep playing down that arrogance, say, you're very lucky. You're very, yeah. very lucky. Don't ever forget that a lot of them have had such hardship they've come out of. And they can actually uh, translate that into doing a lot more good. They can't let their feet go off and... Yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a younger generation. You talked about the challenges of adapting. Yeah. To me, one of yeah. the challenges is understanding the newer generation, for which I have a lot of time, but it's very yeah. different from ours. It's very different yeah. from ours. But yeah, but it, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, remember I, was, I, I was attending this session by uh, Obama and he said something beautiful. He said, when you're successful, you have an ego. I mean, every successful person yes. has some element of ego. But he said, if you can convert that ego into service, right? It's just kind of giving a different shape to it. You know, life can be so much more meaningful. Uh, and we all know success is pretty fleeting, right? It can come and go very, very quickly. Uh, so that, that stuck with me that it's okay to have an ego, but if you can convert that in ego into service for the larger good, I think, uh, and I hope a lot of cricketers in the current generation do that. Maybe I'll go back to a question on commentary. Um, mm. What has been your high point and what has been your low point? You know, the day where you felt, you know, today, I know I've chosen the right profession because this is a moment that very few people get to see. So what is that moment? But I also want to know about the downsides, the point where you were low and out and some controversy happened and you said okay, what am i doing here i want to see both elements of it harsha i've had many of those i've had many of those each time i wasn't sure you talked about partner and purpose each time i wasn't sure i'd reach out and get a more balanced view so that i wasn't reacting emotionally one of the one of my problems early on was that i always reacted very emotionally and all the mistakes i've made in life are when I reacted spontaneously, emotionally, and got angry. Anger is such a horrible enemy of, of people because it forces you to do things that you will always regret afterwards. And that's why, you know, when you're a kid, you always told count to 10. That was a means of ensuring that you're not reacting emotionally. All my mistakes have come in life when I've reacted emotionally. I've, there's an outburst that's, that's uh, come about. But... Yeah, the, the, the biggest low, I think, in my life came through a phase when I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. I thought the environment around me was a little, was getting a little toxic. 
And one day I said, I'm not going. I'm, I'm working on a, on a test match out of a studio. And I got up in the morning and said, I don't want to go. And I did not go. And they said, no, no, but you've got to come. I said, no, I just, I just cannot come. I do not want. And this was the game that has given me everything in life that I've got. I've got out of this one game. And it's a game I've always respected deeply. But I did not go that day. I said, I'm, I'm just not coming because I don't feel like going to work. I've never felt like I'm going to work. But I just said, I'm, I, I just don't. That was the lowest point. You cannot get lower than that. So what happened in 2016 thereafter was something I've, I've never really understood myself. I think I was the easy victim. Mm. Sometimes when you're not, you haven't played the amount of cricket that other people have. And so your judgment is always, all my life, my judgment has been questioned. But I have no issue with that because I, I don't have some of the qualifications. I have some other qualifications. I don't have some other qualifications that others have. But I think it was a mistake. It was done by a very, very famous person. And he was wrong. I'm, I'm saying with great confidence that, that he was wrong because he's a great actor, but he didn't understand my, my profession. Uh, and, and that led to a lot of things. I didn't do much cricket for one, one and a half years. I spent some time being angry. I spent some time being angry, which was the biggest mistake of my life. But the opportunities it opened up afterwards were just mind-blowing. And I mean, talk about pain and suffering. In this case, it was just saying, okay, this is the situation. Let me, let me be alive to new opportunities. It just opened so many opportunities that I otherwise would not have got. And I actually became much richer as an experience, uh, out of that experience. So that, those, those were the lows. But luckily, I've had, uh, uh, I've had not, not that many. The highs are very peculiar, Firoz. And I want to know if that happens in corporate life as well. You know, in a corporate life, there's a big deal to be won. Yeah. Or there's a big case to be won. And you win that case and you say, wow, this was the moment. In my, we don't have those moments in our life. Because you realize much later, you know what, that was the turning point in my life. But at the time it was happening, you didn't realize it was the turning point in your life. And that is why you must always give every moment 100%. Because you don't know which moment you look back and say, that was the moment that my life changed. Because you don't say, I can't go to ground and say, today Tendulkar is playing his last game and I will be on air when Tendulkar is doing his last walk around the ground. I may not be rostered. It was, just, mm. it was just a young producer who said, look, you've known him since you're 14 years old. You speak over these pictures. And that's how a great team works. The other person in Bishop next to me said, yeah, this is your moment. But I can't think of that in the morning. I don't even know if the game's getting over. So if you give every moment 100%, one of those becomes a big jackpot moment where you don't know at the time that, uh, that, 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 that it's happening. Yeah. And because you've asked this question, what I've realized, and this is something that I often teach uh, at Columbia where I talk on leadership, that the moments that are typically your defining moment are moments of pain. And, and you spoke right now about that one and a half years where you were low, but you also said that you, your best phase happened after that. And so my you, worst phase happened after what I thought was the highest point. Absolutely. And so sure. one of the things I say is that pain, purpose, and progress are correlated. You will typically find that you will find your deep meaning or deep insight only in a painful moment, not necessarily in the most celebratory or joyful moment. And typically, once you find your purpose is when you start driving incredible progress. So uh, what you've seen is that it's always a painful moment, which is typically the defining moment. And history has shown this from Buddha to everybody else. It's the pain full moment that where you have this great realization and you kind of, you know, either, and many times it may actually bring you down too, but the real successful ones actually translate that into great progress for themselves and the community. So yeah, I, so I was lucky in that I didn't make it happen. It happened to me. Yeah. A yeah. lot of things in my life have happened to me. I've not made them happen, but what yeah. my pain moment did was it drove me towards people half my age. So it mm -hmm. allowed me to become a little more relevant towards the people that now mattered. So I moved out of a world of my generation or slightly younger, and I got driven by young people into their movement, into their generation. And it was their passion and energy that lifted me. It wasn't that I was doing something and say, you know what, wow, man, I did this. No, it was the energy of all these young people around that lifted me and took me somewhere else. So 
Yeah. So tell me one thing. I I also want to know how you handle compliments, Harsha. You you're so loved. You you know. Yeah. Uh, the fan following is so incredible. I mean, you know, I, I know you will you will play it down, but the reality is. Uh, I, I don't think there's anybody who's as loved as you are. Uh, and I remember you once mentioning that, I think it was in the Pakistan tour when there was somebody who put up a banner saying Harsha Bogle fan club. And how do you handle, you know, you, I'm sure you feel great joy, right? I mean, this is, you know, just yeah. to be honest, it's also great joy, but how do you handle it? And what, are, what is the best compliment that stuck with you? They felt I'm really not, genuinely nice. Yeah. I'm not very good at it, I must admit, because I'm so scared I'll become big-headed. I'm so scared I'll become sure. big-headed that I will lose my skills by becoming big-headed. And that's because I've seen people. I've seen people lose connect with the ground because they start to live this praise that's coming their way. But, you know, sometimes you must say, just let this moment pass and see if the praise is still coming at you. Because praise is ephemeral. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Because we're all, we're all, as I keep telling you, we're on a path to irrelevance. You're here today, gone tomorrow. So I'm, I'm not very good at it. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how to react when people say that. But you'll be surprised at how much anger I get and how much hatred I get. If, mm. you're, if, if you're on social media, there's a lot of very sad people on social media yeah. who believe that throwing muck at people, being angry with them, or criticizing them, Criti criticism is fine, but just being very rude to them is their outlet. Yeah. And so there's a lot of people who are, who keep throwing venom at me all the time, but they've not been able to change my hurt me yet. So it's okay. One you, day they don't, One day they So you don't, you don't normally look at social media. I mean, how, how do you handle you social media? You must, because it keeps you grounded. Yeah. You must know yeah. that there are people who don't like you. Not just mm. that people who like you. Of course, you want to read praise. Of course, yeah. you want to read praise. I mean, I remember one day I did a post-game conversation with MS Dhoni. And it was one of the best I have done. I really enjoyed it because he was in a good mood. And I'll be very honest. I spent 45 minutes an hour reading all the nice things people said about him. I'll mm. be very honest. I did that. But I mm. also read the people who are angry at me. Because sometimes in their anger, they, tell, they point out a mistake that I have committed. Yeah, so beautiful, beautiful. I want to ask a little bit about, you know, you contributed a chapter to this book called Recipes for Life, uh, obviously written by my very dear friend, Sudha Menon. I, I think I've been a little my... unfair to her. I promised her I'd do a couple of things. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting in a spot, but of course, the reason I'm bringing this up is you speak about your mother and her food. Tell me a little bit about, you've written about your favorite food here, Mudda Bhaji and, you know, and all the... My, my... I, I like very simple food. I'm not, I'm not a big food adventure person, yeah. but I, I just love very simple food. One of the biggest problems I have in my profession is I stay in hotels where they can't make simple food. <laughs> yeah. And so the food is either spicy or oily. And that's my biggest stress point, honestly, is the food. I love really simple food. If Anita says we're going to have bharli wangi at home, I say, wow, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sleep thinking tomorrow is a great day. I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to have that. Or we eat, I mean, I, I think we've been pampered at home. We eat such good food at home. But I love these simple food. My mother used to make pal, palag mudda bhaji, chintza gola chi, bhendi chi bhaji, simple stuff. So I go to a hotel and I, I try and meet the chef and I say, I'm your family member. Please cook simple stuff for me. Please do not. And I find some, most of the time they cannot. Yeah. They can only cook rich food. So I love this very simple, you know, food that doesn't try too hard. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for but that. My, but I have a weakness for, 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 for chocolate and pizza. I could eat pizzas for life, man. So I just, every time I see, I, I try and convince myself that a whole wheat, thin crust, less cheese pizza is actually not as bad as it seems. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but, but, uh, I wanted, I had, a, I had a little bit more, I, I wanted to explore a little bit because we're still doing this on an India inclusion uh, platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is one of the things that a lot of, you, that you people talk a lot about. And it's something we yeah. talk about in our talks, but it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't impact us as much. We're not seen as much as you have. Because everybody's good at something. We briefly yeah. touched upon it a little while ago. Everybody yeah. is good at something. How yeah. do you find 
that something that people are good at. For example, dear friend of mine, Kaushik Roy, his son is uh, was diagnosed with autism, but has an, is a great skill for painting. Yeah. How yeah. do you discover these skills in people? Because it is true, everybody is good at something. Yeah, yeah. Good question, Harsha. And maybe uh, that leads us to, you know, we started this campaign called Everybody is Good at Something and people can see this, mm -hmm. everybody is good at something.com where our idea was to make it like the humans of New York or humans of Mumbai, but focus on people with disabilities uh, and everyday stories. So we carry these stories on a daily basis. And that's enough evidence to show that even though people are struggling, have disabilities, have challenges, but we just wanted to put a spotlight on what they are good at. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just incredible to discover that when actually it's proven and we've proven it that if you have a disability, you actually have a corresponding enhanced ability as well. Hmm. And that's something which people don't understand it. So if you're blind, it's proven scientifically that your hearing is better. So instead of focusing on what you cannot see, you could actually turn it around and say, you have an enhanced ability to hear that is better than you and me most of the time. And so there's a lot of evidence to show that every disability has a corresponding enhanced ability. And so our mission is not to focus so much on what you don't have, but focus on what you have. Uh, and it could also be an acquired disability. For example, if you've lost one hand, it's shown that the other hand, just by sheer more practice, is much stronger than most people's mm. arm. So every disability can have a corresponding enhanced ability. And we've coined this term as cool ability. You know, it's a cool ability that you have. So it's not a disability, but it's a cool ability. And we say it's just a shift in the way you see things. And if you can do that, you can do that with everybody, right? Uh, and so, you know, like you said about a lot of times people on the autism spectrum, they may not be social, but they have great attention for detail. So, you know, there's a corresponding enhanceability. Mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, one of the you know, yeah. missions that we are at is to kind of, not to say that people don't have disabilities, people have it and we have to accept it. But if you put the spotlight on the enhanced ability, uh, we can always find that something that everybody is good at. It's such a it's such a beautiful thought that resonates in all aspects of life, and it's happening in HR across the world. Should you focus on what you cannot do, or should you focus uh, on what you can? And I know yeah. Anita keeps saying that when we were younger in school, we were always put in classes for what we were not good at. Yeah. Whereas yeah. today's parents are putting people in classes for what children are good at. Yeah. Absolutely. And I thought that was an amazing insight. But what you're telling me has moved me to... I'll, I'll, I'll let you into another secret. I have cried at times yeah. by myself, hearing happy stories of people who achieve lovely things, which, yeah. which society almost ensured they couldn't. And they fought yeah. through that and achieved. I mean, how do people climb mountains? Yeah. And yeah. they do. And it yeah. just tells me that our minds are so small. Maybe because yeah. our other senses are developed, our minds have become so much smaller that because yeah. of a certain disability, their minds have become so much bigger that they become yeah. far greater humans than we can ever be. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things we've been trying to do at our foundation. One of the things we launched is called the Inclusion Fellowship, where we say we support people who are trying to build a more inclusive world where they are trying to amplify the voices of the marginalized or the ones who don't have, I think those are the stories, you know, Harsha, I will invite you for one of these fellowship discussions. These are young entrepreneurs who are trying to solve the problem for the marginalized, for the people with disabilities. And it would, every time I bring a speaker, they go back teary eyed and say, invite me anytime I will be there because I've got moved. And more than that, I've got hope. Mm -hmm because you suddenly see people trying to solve problems that most people don't even want to look at. You know, and it's such an enlightening you know, session. You know, the media, the media focuses largely on the superficial. The reason yeah. people come to you again and again is because you reach out to a different sense in, in, in people. And why would be, there is a goodness latent in the worst human being? Yeah. And if you reach out to that goodness like you do, you'll find that people are actually very, very happy to deliver. And I think you must go out on this program and say, right, there's an India Inclusion Fellowship. How do people yeah. contribute to it? 
Sometimes yeah. you may not have the time, but you may have the resources to contribute, and that might help someone else. Uh, someone else do better. So I think you must put it out. Next time we do this program, we'll, we'll actually we'll actually put it out, yeah. saying that's what that that's what you do. Give a plug Thank to your you. book as well. You got your book around with you. What a yeah. There you go. The Invisible Majority. So guys, a lot of you watching do do read it. I think the India Inclusion Fellowship is a fabulous idea. and I, i think sure we part of it there is no there is no limit or there is no there is no size to what you can give right yeah if, if yeah. i have 10 if i have a, a rupee in my pocket and i give 5 paisa that's that's still far yeah. more generous than most people and you know i always uh, one of the things that i often quote is what mother teresa said that it's not how much you give it's how you give that matters if you give with love that's all that matters and you've done this so often harsha no, not as much no not as much honestly uh, i'm yeah. in a profession because of a certain visibility where if i do x people assume it's 5x or 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 10x and there's people who do 10x and no one knows about it it's is a benefit of being in the uh, position i'm in but we cannot get carried away by that yeah we do a little bit but nowhere near what people like you do thank you so much harsha for your time this has been you know more than a, an hour i didn't even realize and we haven't Asked, we haven't discussed much of cricket, so you know my hope just, was I've at least asked you one question that nobody has ever asked you. I hope I did that. Uh, it's, it's just a game. Really... I talk cricket all the time. <laughs> so this is this was so yeah. much more fun. Thank you so much, Harsha. Maybe one last question. Sure. What next for you? I mean, you're now sixty, and what next? And what's the next big thing? that you want to achieve or we want to do or if there was no covid or maybe i'll fr- phrase it a little differently if there was uh, no covid and no cricket what would you have done you know assuming a whole calendar empties up for you and there is no cricket at all so there's no commentary but there's also no covid which means you can actually go out and do all the fun things what would you have done let me ask this as a final question sure. it's a scary thought because i've always had to fight very hard to get what i have i have lost out on knowing what to do when i have options mm. so um, and it it worries me and so that's why i just took two months off this time the first time i just i'm not doing anything for two months i mean i'm not doing cricket for two months and let me see how i react and i did start off with fomo i'm being admit, i'm i'm admitting honestly i'm not doing that series over i'm not doing that because i've always had to fight very hard to get what i've got so that what that does though is while it gives drives you it takes you away from the joys and i think at 60 and we don't have a lot more time left so if we don't start to enjoy life now then when are we going to but i do not know i mean i've been so obsessed with this game so maybe I, maybe i'll just go and travel and see beautiful places i I'd, I'd, i'd love to do that well one of the things covid has done is it's it's told us how valuable the little things we took for granted were yeah i agree and i i mean we we're all we're all far 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 luckier than most but yeah. i'm starting to get i'm i'm it's 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 get, it's getting to me like it's getting to everybody now yeah arsha thank you so much i can't thank most you strength to you, my friend most strength to you and thank hit you. that typewriter feel your little <laughs> finger pains when you're doing q w e r t r that little finger with the q and the little finger with the p it hurts <laughs> Yeah. Thank you and wish you all the best Pleasure, and thanks. look forward to hearing you again and have a great rest of uh, you you're taking a two month break right i don't know how much it's almost over there. i've got another it's two almost weeks almost over so i caught you at the right time thank you so much yeah. and god speed take care Pleasure. thank you very much for us more power to you my friend thank you so much thank you everyone yeah. thank you to all the listeners just give me a minute harsha <clears throat>